I'm not going to talk about his accomplishments. I don't want to talk about who he is. But I do want to share three very short stories with you. About four or five years ago, I was trying to reach a man. I sent about two dozen SMSs. There was absolutely no response. It was like sending a beam into outer space. And then in utter frustration one day, I sent an SMS saying, Shah Rukh, do you exist or are you a unicorn? And in three minutes flat, I got a call back. We spoke, and then we decided to meet for a story. I went down to Bombay. I went up a hill. There was a studio there. The sun was setting. There were charred buildings everywhere, men with walkie-talkies dressed in black, guns, a sort of hush in the air. And then suddenly, somebody dressed in a red suit, in a sort of Superman cape, swooshed into the air, holding a woman, a beautiful woman, in a red dress, a long split down her leg. They whooshed up into the sky, the cape flying, and then this man and this woman came down, and this man said, Uri Baba, my name is Mohabbat Man, let's dance. And then a year later, we met at Bonhams in London, and two legendary people had agreed to paint a canvas to help fund the Helka that was going through extremely rough times financially. And we held our art exhibition there, again, where the artist community supported us hugely by painting canvases for free. And we wanted to auction this, raise funds for the journalism. Bonhams is a very elite auction house in London. The biggest crowd they've ever seen is 300 people. We told them maybe 450 might turn up. And then this man walked into Bonhams, and Bonhams had 1,800 people in a hall that could accommodate 300. The auction was a washout. <laughs> Nobody knew what was happening, but everybody's eye was on this one man. His friends say that for him and for others who wait for him, time begins when he arrives. He's here today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Shah Rukh Khan. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, I have auditioned for many parts, but for the Think uh, Fest, the auditioning happened, and I was passed by Shoma straight away when I said, Uri Baba, I'm Mohabbat Man. <laughs> so this guy is smart. We have to get him for Think. So thank you very much, Shoma. Thank you, Tarun. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, everybody who's involved with this. And uh, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Let's start. <laughs> Shahrukh, okay. So before, before I start, so I, because, because I was told, one of my friends, Sanjoy, my oldest friend, oldest in terms of years that I've known him, he's told me this is like an intelligent gathering. And, uh, so you uh, actually prepped for it. I was yeah, aghast yeah. when uh, Shahrukh's uh, colleague called me and said, Shahrukh wants to know what you're going to talk about. Are there any questions? And I was like, Shahrukh's asking for questions, you know? Yeah, so, I've, but, I've become careful now because you never know what the hell come and write about you, you know, these... <laughs> I'm scared now, yeah, I'm a little scared of what I say. So I, I have written something, is it okay to read it out or? Um, yeah, but can we do the conversation? Did you bring your book? I just wanted to... Uh... That's why I don't go to any place where stars are considered less than the anchors. I'm telling you, Shama, this is... <laughs> but I'm here now, so I'll allow you, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Shahrukh, you know, as I, when I asked you to come here, I, I told you that the really unique uh, experience that I wanted our audience to have is that Shah Rukh is in the process of writing his memoir and his autobiography. And about two years ago, we met and he shared a, a, some snatches of that with me. And they were incredibly moving. They were an aspect of Shah Rukh that you don't really get to see very often. And that is the framework of our conversation today, you know, the public and private journey of this dream catcher. And, and that's how I'd like to enter the conversation with you, Shah Rukh. You know, the, the, the piece you read to me was about your parents. Uh, both of them have been very seminal uh, in who you are today, and yet they were both very different people. Your father was a freedom fighter, he was an idealist, uh, you know, very accomplished man, but a poor man. Uh, and your mother was much more of a pragmatist. You know, can you, can you talk to us about what they meant in your life and how they've cha influenced you in different ways? Yeah, my father, I, in the book that I'm still writing, which has been now, uh, you know, I, I decided to write the book when I thought I would last uh, after four or five years into the film industry, I started believing that I will last for 10 years. And I wrote a book, <clears throat> the title was 20 Years of a Decade, because I felt I've crammed in 20 years into the 10 years. 
Uh, I'm a little tardy with it. I still haven't finished it. Now it's 22 years that I've been working. The book is still not complete. Um, and, you know, when I, in, in the book, the chapter that I made Shoma read, uh, the main, uh, how do you say, the exposure of my inner self is that I think my father was the most successful failure in the world. And I'm very, very proud of him. And um, I remember him as a gentle, uh, as a very gentle person, six feet tall, very Pathan, gray eyes, brown hair, very handsome. Um, I also remember the first time I went to Peshawar with him. You know, the whole family was over six feet, two inches, very fair, very beautiful. And I remember the whole family met me first time and I was about 14 and they say, they speak Hindko there, like Punjabi. And they looked at me and said, Innu ki ho gaya? Ete Pathan lagda hi nahi hai. You know, so I'm, I'm that kind of Pathan. And uh, he, he, he taught me a lot of things. I, he died when I was 15. And, uh, and as years are going by, I remember things that he's told me. I remember he took me out for a movie. Uh, never told me we belong to a place where, you know, in terms of finances, lower middle class or however it's described, we don't, we don't have the money. Um, he used to travel in buses, 501, 502, 500, 500, Delhi wali, 500. And uh, he took me and uh, he didn't tell me money's run out. So he made me sit in the, there used to be a roundabout near Kamani Auditorium. And we bought Moongfali. And he said, Yaan baithenge. Or gaadiyon ko, he used to also speak a little bit of Punjabi. He said, Yara, gaadiyon ko aage piche jate dekhenge. Sabse achcha hota hai. And he never told me. My mom, who was Hyderabadi and uh, a little more uh, pragmatic, as you said, and a little more talkative and loud, she said, hmm, tumko buddhu banai una. Ja ke vahan pe kuch nahi, paise nahi the, to isliye tumhe gaadiyan dikha kar wapis lekar a gaye. So my mother was uh, extremely, uh, I think after he died, she kind of dedicated her life uh, to look after us. And the essence of both my parents was that they didn't know what we'd become. My father was a non-practicing lawyer because he said he can't lie. So sorry if there are some lawyers here. We said, many karunga. He was the youngest freedom fighter of this country in terms of age. And uh, my mother was a magistrate, but she was like a go-getter and, you know, very enthusiastic. And uh, after he died, uh, she carried on the dream my father had that we should make sure that children are well educated. If they get educated, life will be okay for them. Of course, I wasted all my education. I've done sciences, then economics, and then masters in mass communication. And I became a film star. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so it's kind of doesn't come handy when you're doing, you are my chamak chalo. It <laughs> uh, so, um, and that's it. So I remember them. I think I've imbibed the fear of failure that I saw my father go through. And I didn't want to fail like him. I want to take my son out. If I promise him for a movie, I want to show him a movie, not the cars around the roundabout. Though that was fun too. And uh, <clears throat> the enthusiasm and the energy that my mother had to earn money so that, you know, she could look after us and educate us. They both died, I think, between the ages of 49 and 50. I just turned 47 day before yesterday, so it's a little scary thought. But uh, uh, it, it was an education which makes me a very pragmatic, practical poet, I think. <laughs> yeah, it makes me a very commercial poet, I think. It makes me someone who has dreams like my father did, someone who's as gentle as I am, notwithstanding the Mumbai Cricket Association incident. We'll come to that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm a believer. I'm a little idealistic and utopian and thoughtful and gentle like my dad. But I want to do all those thinking and write all those poems with a stomach full of food and have a good car and a good house. So I don't deride myself or deprecate myself when I say I'm kind of capitalist. It is just that I am a survivor who wants to live well and think well. And I think all youngsters should believe that. If you isolate one of them, I've been hearing amazing amount of dedicated work from some of the people, extremely educated and highly positioned jobs, leaving everything and looking after um, a cause which is close to their hearts. I would like to do that. But being from the place I believe which is kind of honest, I like to do it with the money that I earn from this capitalist, this in-your-face business-like job that I do. So I, I want to uh, I imbibe, I think, both the things that my mom and dad taught. And I still miss them a lot. Yeah, in fact, uh, 
Shahrukh, he, he used to run a tea canteen uh, behind the NSD, and you were thrown out of your house once because they couldn't pay the rent. Are you going to tell everything about me? Tehelka has been... <laughs> this is a Tehelka expose, this is a sting operation here. <laughs> no. yeah? This is stuff you've told me, you know? Okay. <laughs> and not, not, not with any privacy uh, clauses. <laughs> okay. But, you know, in fact, in an interview some years back, and I'm, I'm j why I'm asking you all this is because it's very much the man you are, and you know, some of that comes through in the tweets that you do at three o'clock at night and four o'clock at night, not when you meet you on the stage or on the cinema screen. And you said that your sister, you know, your mother died in very difficult circumstances, and you said your sister also is a kind of daily reminder that you cannot have the life that your father has, you know, your father lived and your father had. Can you share that with us, you know, what really happened? Because a lot of that went into making you the kind of superstar that you are. Yeah, my father died of uh, a cancer, uh, throat and liver. It started with throat and uh, I remember the last few days, uh, uh, he couldn't speak. So we used to play dumb charades and, uh, you know, we used to kind of, um, he used to write stuff, then he couldn't write stuff, so he would say, call um, little and then brother or sister. So I, I, I remember this was at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, at the Jung Hospital. And, um, uh, and he obviously, like any father, was in love with his uh, daughter. And she was very beautiful. Everyone used to think she looked like Jane Fonda. My whole family is very Just to let you know. <laughs> so, uh, she was extremely beautiful. And um, uh, when my father died, I remember he, he was getting well. Then I went to the hospital one night and he was dead and cold. His feet, his feet were very cold. So I touched his feet and he was very peaceful and dead and not looked like the handsome Pathan he was. It's very thin. And uh, I had never driven a car. I was 15 and I remember my mom and me sat in the car to get back home. A driver who had waited all night, couldn't wait any longer, had left the car abandoned in front of the uh, main road. And I sat in the car and drove back. And I do remember my mother, when we reached home, she said, uh, and I said, Kab sikha? And I said, just now. And I was driving a car. I came home. My sister was in Lady Shiram College. And uh, we didn't tell her that her father, our father was, uh, has passed away. So I went, I got her, and I remember this. And uh, because I'm a soul selling commercial actor, one day I will use this in a film also, shamelessly. But 99% uh, of the things that I use so shamelessly in films is an experience which is very close to my heart. And uh, somehow, life has taught me it's all right to show the innermost of my feelings in the commercial sense. Not to earn money, but just, it's okay. It's one life. So I will use this. I remember my sister standing in front of my father's Parthiv Sharid Bolte in Hindi dead body and she just looked, she didn't cry, she didn't say anything, she just fell. And she hit her head on the ground. And for two years after that, she didn't cry, she didn't speak, she just kept looking uh, in space. And uh, it just changed her world. Mashallah, now she's better. Uh, she got some deficiencies. I've, uh, during the making of my film, Dilwale Dulaniya Le Jayenge, she again was hospitalized and they said she will not survive. I took her to Switzerland, uh, got her treated there while I was shooting and, uh, but she hasn't ever recovered from the loss of her father, the suddenness of him passing away. And then it got uh, compounded because my mother also expired 10 years later. So we are what in Muslims is called Yatim and Yaseer, father and motherless. And uh, when I see her, <coughs> especially the time period from my father's death to my mother's death, she was highly qualified. She has done MALLB, very intelligent. Um, like my parents wanted her to be, but she could not face the reality of losing her parents. And I somehow developed the sense of detachment, the sense of false bravado, which I show in public, uh, a sense of humor, and a lot of things that I do which people think is flamboyant and very Bollywood-like, to cover up uh, <clears throat> the sadness affecting my life, and me becoming like my sister. I love my sister how she is. She's a much better person than I can ever be. I think she's a, a child of God and very naive and innocent. My kids love her more than they love me and my wife. And I'm very glad she's a part of our lives like this. 
but I don't have the guts to be so simple, so hurt, so disturbed. So a part of me keeps on working <clears throat> round the clock, keeps on being happy in spite of things which are said about me, or make a joke about things that I do, but still keep doing them, because if I did not do it, I think I would be in the same state of potassium deficiency and depression. So to avoid depression, I act. Um, it's much larger than to earn money or be a big star or do endorsements or dance at weddings, which I joke about. And this is the God's honest truth. I think this is the most honest I've ever been in my life to anyone. <clears throat> Sharuk, before, before we move away from this, this series of central events that happened in your life and you know how, how it continues to pursue you, would you share with the audience that, that snatch about your father passing away? Did you bring it with you? <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have it on my laptop. I, I, you know, I tried to print out a lot of things, but technologically we are a little challenged still. You had it on your Kindle, but... Yeah, I, 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 if I can get the laptop, I'll, okay, I'll ask them to bring it and do it in a oh, moment or two. Okay, yeah. so we, we, we'll, we'll come back to that. Have I screwed up major with this disorganization of mine? No. <laughs> I'm really that. sorry. I, okay. Oh, no, it's here. Okay. Okay this, uh, okay, this is very small, but I'll still... Uh, I'll, 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 this is an incident about... Uh, this chapter is called The Train to Pakistan. I finally learned that life isn't a timed test with the goal is to make a list of shouldas, couldas, wouldas on January 1st and finish as fast as possible with every answer correct and be perfect about it. I, I have taken sayings, what people have said and started my chapter, so I won't read the whole chapter and bore you. But I'll, I'll describe the portion when my father, who had taken me twice to Peshawar, um, and we had gone always through uh, Amritsar, walked through to Lahore, where I even did a film called Veer Zara, which brought back a lot of memories. And I cried there because I had done the same with my dad. So I'm just reading you the last part, where the second time we went, every time my father uh, told me a lot of stories about how wonderful his uh, hometown was, Kisa Khani, and Lahori di Hatti, and my father, uh, by the time I was born, wasn't doing well business-wise. Wives, as they are always, were, you know, tum kuch karte kyun nahi, kind of a thing. So I think he needed to go back to his past to keep on telling me uh, how wonderful it was. And he took me twice to Peshawar. This is the second time in 1980 when he took me. So I'm just reading the last bit, which I read to Shoma. My father got me back to Peshawar once again in 1980. The second time round was also turning out to be as exciting. But without my knowledge, there was something else taking place right under my nose. I was told by my father's friend that all this niceness that my cousins were showing me was to impress my father into leaving his share of property in their names. I still don't believe that was true. But my father seemed to be dejected when we returned back to India. My father was always very proud of his family and their achievements. But in retrospect, I think that his going back to his family was not as great an experience as he'd anticipated. He was a very loving and gentle person, never having screamed at us or reprimanded us. He had left his house when he was 16. He had tried desperately to try and make things work in India. I think at times when he felt he hadn't succeeded with his duties to his family in India, he had taken courage from the fact that his family in Pakistan had brought him up well and he would be able to fight back. Maybe his journey back home was to refresh this resolve. And he had taken his little son along to give him a taste of his lineage. I think it was like trying to revisit his past and pass it on to his future. It's like when you are a little lost, you try to retrace your steps to figure out where you went wrong. But the past had changed with time. It was not the same for him. The memory of all the an anecdotes and good times he had collected with pride over the years seemed tainted by the bickering and fight for something as menial as the possession of his property rights. He had got his son along to introduce him to his proud past, but the past wasn't there. And what was left of it was not something to be proud of either. <clears throat> Instead of finding out where he had gone wrong, he realized that the beginning itself was a mistake. He was too far gone to start all over again. Neither side seemed to be his. He was in the no man's land. I remember him crying while walking along the no man's land between Pakistan and India. 
and I felt sad for him. Little did I know, by the time we got back, I would have to start feeling sad for myself. My father was beginning to die. And uh, this, is, this is an incident where I remember we were between uh, the no man's land in, between India and Pakistan. And he kind of said to me, you know, <clears throat> I know there are a lot of uh, confusing discussions about India, Pakistan, and I'm, I'm okay if this leads to some kind of controversy. But, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he was like, Yara, tu wahan chalega na? To wahan pe... Somehow, it, he just told me, khana bhi better hai, log bhi achche hai, pyar bhi bhaut karte hai. And he used to keep telling the bamboos are better in Peshawar. I don't know, for some reason. I've never found that out yet. Yeah, bamboos are better in Peshawar. And, uh, and you believe your father, whatever he says. So, till my dying day, I'll remember the best bamboos come from Peshawar for some reason. Yeah. And I remember he was walking in between the no man's land and he started crying. And, you know, to see your father cry is like a mega thing for a 14-year-old kid. And he said, um, I said, but it was really nice your country. And he said to me, you know, actually I'm feeling like neither that nor that is my country. This is my country. The no man's land that he was walking on. Because he somehow felt he's not succeeded here and his, uh, uh, you know, his past was not good enough to take him through where he wanted his son to be. And I truly believe that visit, not because of his cousins and his brothers, you know, that whatever, that's a young kid's uh, belief. But I think he just got so completely wasted by the fact that, uh, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> neither of the two things were working for him, his past or future. And I think he died that day while walking back, uh, because he died about f three months after that. He came home and he fell sick and, uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> in spite of people telling me politically not to go to Pakistan, I have other reasons <laughs> which are a little more personal. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us, Shavit. Sharuk, we'll, we'll come back to some of those early years, but there was another interesting uh, spectrum in your life. You know, the kind of guy you were in Delhi and the man you have become in Bombay. And you were two very different people. Uh, you know, can you share with us the kind of college kid you were, tempestuous? I won't add on to the adjectives you tell us yourself and how you've designed yourself uh, as a superstar. No, no, I was always like this, very elegant, I always wore a Dolce & Gabbana suit. And <laughs> extremely educated. St. Stephen's wanted me to study there, but I said, no, yeah. <laughs> 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 I, I, <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't know how to describe, I don't know how many of the people here at the Think Fest are from Delhi, they will understand. Um, are there lots of Delhiites here? Yeah. I'm a Delhi boy, so uh, uh, there is a bit of... Uh, uh, <clears throat> a lot of Delhi in me, and uh, I, I think, uh, in, in a nice sense, I say, please, uh, I, I think I'm a Delhi ka gunda. <laughs> Delhi mein jo bhi paida hote hain, bade hote hain, wo gunda hi hote hain. Oye, idhar aave saale, niche ko aas saale ke dekh rahe, idhar aave. Teri maa ki, teri pehen ki. So, I was, I was kind of like that, brought up like that. I was in an Irish brother school, so I was having this strange uh, dichotomy of being brought up where, you know, everything was where, you know, everybody spoke like that and talked like that and, you know, in the morning we said the morning prayer and your shoes are not shined, Mr. Khan. So I was called Mr. Khan even, as a matter of fact, I was called Mr. Shah because, uh, yeah, because we don't write Khan till you're 18, so my name was Shah Rukh and my Irish brothers thought that either my name is Mr. Shah, my parents' name or Mr. Rukh. So I was, yeah, so I was like, you know, Mr. Shah, so I was Gujarati for a part of my <laughs> upbringing. <laughs> so I uh, uh, said, so you know, I, was, I used to play hockey and, you know, in Delhi everybody just fights for their rights. And, <laughs> for their rights. <laughs> <laughs> in a nice way. And, um, you know, so uh, I was brought up like that. When I came to Mumbai, I got into a lot of fights, a lot of fights. And uh, I didn't understand the stardom stuff. I'm from Delhi, you know, you talk nicely, everybody has to be well-mannered, I'm very well-mannered, I'm very courteous, I'm very, you know, that's the upbringing I have in the Irish brother school, St. Columbus, so, so I'm very well-mannered, but Battamizi mujhe samaj nahi aati. So the first time when I came, I remember there was a magazine, which I was just talking about uh, downstairs uh, with Tarun and everyone, where, where they kind of uh, put me on the cover of a magazine and had written a line that I had sort of been, uh, uh, how, how do you put it, decently in a think fest, uh, physical with a uh, co-actress. 
Yeah. And I hadn't you been. You don't have to get that decent shot. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I was banging the shit out of this. Uh, <laughs> Apologies to my Irish brother school. <laughs> this is the Delhi wala part. So, um, I, you know, so they had written, and I didn't understand this, you know. I've just been married. And, you know, you, you have a young girl. I've known my wife when she was 14. I just got married. She was about 22. For her, this guy becoming a movie star, what you think of Bollywood, or in that time it was just the Indian film industry. And, you know, she was so uh, worried. Will I be doing what supposedly movie stars will do and do in the films apart from acting? And this whole thing came out, and I'm like, you know, but this is not true. And so I called up this lady, and I said, um, you know, why have you written this? So she said, Charu, it's a joke. She said, it's a joke, but it's not funny. I, lady, do you hear me talking, uh, laughing? And I wasn't saying it like this. I said, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, i it wasn't her mistake, I think, but she didn't understand what I was talking because, you know, I was speaking in Delhi language. And all I went there, I fought, I beat up people, and I did some really, really nasty stuff, which is a natural thing that Delhiites do. They don't know in their other parts of the country it's considered nasty. <laughs> so I, I behaved really badly, and uh, I was jailed, and uh, I'd, uh, my, my father in law had given me, as they do in Delhi, in Punjabi weddings, a sword to carry on the ghodi when I got married to my wife Gauri. And um, uh, I carried that sword to that journalist's house. <laughs> You're exaggerating now. Yeah, my father-in-law had told me, uh, he's an army officer, so he said, son, make sure you protect my daughter. <laughs> so nobody was saying anything to her daughter, but I, <laughs> I thought this is a good weapon and uh, it's sanctioned by the Indian Army, so I... <laughs> So I went there and um, I remember that young boy, uh, he's shifted to Vancouver since then. Uh, yeah, but I talk to him now, now that I've become a gentleman. Um, so he, he was sitting there and, you know, in his shorts and the whole office was sitting there and I took, it was a kukri actually, it was not even a sword. So I took the kukri and I stuck it between his legs. <laughs> and I don't know why, like an idiot, now that I think of it, I looked at his parents and I said, you know, I'm gonna cut him up. And, and the poor, you know, this old couple were just sitting, they didn't understand anything. <laughs> they were like, you know, so many other people have come for dinner and a chat. <laughs> why is this gentleman behaving like this, beta? And why is he trying to do this with his sword between your legs? <laughs> and uh, so I got into a big fight and then one day, I was next day, and I thought I've done the Delhi Wali thing, ki pen, ke saale agli baar kisi ne kiya na, kaat dalunga, to dalunga, pho dalunga, tumari maada. Like, kind of, I've repeated my dialogues at MCA, Zinda gaar dunga zameen <laughs> and all I did, all that stuff. And then I went away, thinking I won this battle. Next evening, I was shooting for a film called Kabhi Haan Kabhi Na, which is one of my favorite films, and I was doing a Sean, uh, I was acting like a comic Don, uh, ironically. And cops came, who were very sweet, and they talked to me, they took pictures with me, and then they said, you know, Saab ne aapko bulaya hai. So I said, yeah, yeah, of course, I'll come, yeah. My mother was a magistrate. I've been in jail in Delhi many times. And my mother, uh, you know, these things work in Delhi. You can kind of make a call and say, meri mummy magistrate hai. So, I used to be. Uh, so for a few fights and all, my mother had get, got me out of uh, the lockup. So, um, uh, mom wasn't alive, but they took me and they, and they took me after six o'clock, so I can't get bail. And uh, so <laughs> I remember I... <laughs> Uh, there was this gentleman, uh, Inspector Mr. Khan, and I went in and, you know, with my swagger, this was the chair, he was standing there, and I'm like, yeah. No, if I was from Delhi, so I used to walk like that. Just till then I, so I stood and I was, and I said, yes, what's this? I said, Petoni! Cut it off, Ampe! what? And I'm like, Aaj meri maa zinda hoti na. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he put me in a lockup, and then he said, you're allowed to make one phone call. And that's when I realized I'm cut out to be a Hindi film hero. Because instead of making that one phone call to my family, friends, or any lawyer that I would have had, which I didn't, I made the call to that guy who had reported me. <laughs> and I said, Saleh, I'm jail. And I'm going to get out of jail, and I'm going to cut my hair. And 
Ah, is this going to get me in trouble? <laughs> I doubt it. You think and it, if it will, you're well prepared. You've had long yeah, training. I mean, <laughs> this RTI, India Against Corruption, won't take out these papers and put me back. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I, I do remember that I went back to the guy's house. There were cops outside his house. And I asked for a light from one of the cops who was very still, oh, Shahrukh Khan, Shahrukh Khan. He lit my cigarette. I opened the window, looked at that guy. I said, I'm coming and get you now. I'm going to be very mean to you. I threatened the, everyone in their office. But then, you know, it so happened that I was, re they put my fingerprints and, you know, then this. Uh, Inspector Khan Sab told me, revenge tastes the sweetest when it is served cold. <laughs> so, that was 19 years ago. I'm still waiting for when will Vancouver come back from Vancouver. But I, I just okay. felt I was very embarrassed. And I decided to change myself because the wife was very disturbed. Nana Patekar got me out of the jail, finally. And he was very sweet. And uh, on a weekend, there is an evening court that gives you bail or something. And uh, I tried to be decent, uh, and I kind of have changed now. I try to be the more Irish brother school educated than the Delhi University while a hockey player. And um, yeah. Sometimes so, the Delhi ka kunda jumps up again. I, you know, what I'm feeling very bad about is that, you know, some of the people have started saying that it's my midlife crisis. <laughs> and uh, I'm having a meltdown. You know, so I was telling Tarun backstage, you know, Sanjoy and everyone, that tab YouTube nahi tha. So, if there YouTube, there are many fights in there. So, when there are many fights in there, it feels like it's doing it, it's coming naturally. So, I just want to say this, and all you really intellectual people, I, I'm not going through a midlife crisis. I'm good. I'm really good. I'm, I'm cool, yeah. And I'm... <laughs> I'm just going through the Delhi phases once in a while, that's all. Yeah. Sharuk, the other fascinating strand in you is your uh, relationship with Islam and with being a Muslim. Over the years, you've become more overt about uh, just identifying yourself as a Muslim, you know? And you're not a political person at all. Uh, why did you want to start doing this? And, you know, you also say you're a real chauvinist and you're an Islamist chauvinist, you know? So how do the two things uh, sit together? I don't understand this I'm getting scared big, big words you're using with me and all. But I, to be honest, like, um, I have been uh, uh, living in Delhi, like I said, and I have participated in Ram Leela. I have studied in an Irish brother school, so I am being uh, uh, made to, um, in every nice way, I know the Ram, Ramayan very well, um, the Mahabharat very well, because I used to act in them and, you know, whole Punjabi atmosphere. Uh, because of my upbringing in St. Columbus, so I know the Bible very well. And it's very strange, I never thought I'll be an actor, but I've enacted pieces and bits in school at, uh, on the stage, Chhabla Saab Ki Ram Leela and stuff, in Delhi, Patel Nagar. And, um, and by birth, I'm, I'm, I'm Muslim, you know, I'm Islamic. So uh, my father and mother, in a very nice uh, uh, way, have explained Islam to me. And as I've grown now, and I have kids, I, 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 I'm very secular. My wife's a Hindu. And, uh, um, and I, I've never tried to impose my religion on her, neither has she ever. Uh, you know, but I, I really believe, uh, to be very honest, each religion is about being easy with each other's selves and each other's religion. So I am like that. But now when the kids were growing up and all this was happening around the world, um, I just felt that my parents have always taught me and my understanding and reading about Islam is that we are very peaceful. And uh, so in no political way, as you said, in no chauvinistic way, as you mentioned, but the way I only know through a film of mine, maybe, you know, so I was looking for an opportunity which I got in my film, My Name is Khan, that I want to say that, you know, it's an extremely peaceful religion. And that's all I want to impose upon even my children, that if they can learn anything from Islam, being now Aryan Khan and Suhana Khan, uh, I think the only thing they need to really take back is the fact that it's a very peace-loving religion. And they are growing up in times where Every bomb that is being bombed, every bullet that is being fired is uh, supposedly by Muslim people, you know. And uh, I, I don't want my kids to have that kind of an impression because I truly believe that uh, maybe most of these guys or at least a big majority of these guys do not really stand for Islam. They stand for their own agenda of whatever fundamentalism they want to uh, get through or their political ideologies or whatever issue they have with nation to nation or person to person. But I don't think necessarily they stand for Islam. So 
I started reading all over again in the languages that I know, English and Hindi. I started speaking to some really wonderful people like Javed Saab, who might be here tonight, you know, explain to me, my friends who are like really um, well versed with Islam, I speak to them, I talk with them. Inshallah, I'd like to do the Hajj with my kids. And, uh, but the imposition of my religion would be to the extent of saying that it's an extremely peace-loving and uh, wonderful religion. And uh, uh, the film was for that. And uh, uh, though, like again, my behavior lately does not really, you know, like my son can turn around and he, we have a great sense of humor. So this is a joke, please don't take it wrong. Uh, I'm saying this, but like, you know, my son does not. And I got into this fight with another person at night and, you know, I came back and I woke them both up. I'm very embarrassed about how I behave in films, off screen, everything that I do with my kids. <laughs> so I woke them up and I said, you know, I, I slapped a guy man, and I'm really sorry and stuff like that. And my son, and this is a joke, so please don't take it wrong. He said, that's very like a Muslim Baba. <laughs> you know, so I don't want him <laughs> thinking that. Right? And, like, and we joke and we say things like, uh, Wallah. You know, like this. And uh, the thing is that I've been able to bring them to be able to joke about it now means I'm on the right path of explaining to them that Islam is an extremely peaceful uh, religion like I'm sure Hinduism is and Buddhism is and Christianity is. Sharuk, uh, you know, before we start talking about some other, uh, you know, phases and aspects of your life, did you bring that part the first page of what it means to be a star, you know, you, the first page of your book, uh, you're kind of watching yourself flying. Did, did you bring any other bits of it? I have now the whole laptop. I've got the script of my next two films if you want me to read them out. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, let me see. Uh, this, is, this is actually, sorry, this is the last chapter. Oh, okay. So, oh, sorry. That I, that I printed out. I thought maybe after I've read my opening speech, which you haven't allowed me to. <laughs> I will read out my last chapter of the book, so it'll kind of make everyone feel what a wonderfully organized and rounded <laughs> talk we had tonight. Um, but but this, is, this is really true. Uh, this book was, like I said, I wrote it, uh, uh, I started writing it long, so my daughter was only four or five. And this chapter is written, now she's 12, eight years ago. And this would be, this will be the last chapter. I'm filling in the rest of the blanks. But I think this will be the last chapter. I started writing this book while I was standing jumping for a movie called Pirbi Dil Hindustani uh, from a 16th story building uh, onto an airbag. And I do not exaggerate, I have done that. And, uh, uh, and, and this thought came to me that I, I should write a book because Bhatsa, Mahesh Bhatsa had told me. So the book starts, I was going to say the movie starts <laughs> like that. The book is like a movie. And now it's the last chapter and I'm still standing there. So. <clears throat> a lot of it has to be updated, so please um, uh, bear with me, but this is eight years ago. It's been one hell of a trip, it's been one hell of a life, a busted knee, an ankle which needs repair, a big toe which is much bigger than any big toe, a neck which has one disc less and is still capable of doing the boogie woogie. Let me also share a secret, I dye my hair. I've been atop a train and under a moving truck, I have romance in oxygen-less Ladakh and fought in the slush. I have jumped from multi-storied buildings and hung from cliffs. I have stood in the same frame as Mr. Amitabh Bachchan. I have been hugged by Rakhi. Dilip Kumar has patted me on my cheek and praised me for playing Devdas. Madhuri Dikshit has danced in front of me for nine nights. <laughs> Juhi Chavla has made coffee for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Kajol has bought me books to read. Amrish Puri has shared a dirty joke with me. I have, met Madonna, I have met Madonna and said hello to Michael Jackson. Harry Potter has stood and talked with me for 15 minutes. I have said the namaz in the deserts of Egypt, close to the pyramids. I have climbed the Eiffel Tower. People in Japan know me by name. Mothers in Indonesia and Guyana call me their son. Yash Chopra and Subhash Ghai are my friends. Mani Ratnam thinks I can act a bit. Urchins on the road copy my way of talking. Barber shops on the roadside have a haircut named after me. I have a nice house and lovely children. My son thinks I'm a hero, and this is eight years ago, and my daughter thinks I'm Amir Khan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she was young and stupid then. <laughs> 
I, she was four years old. So on, at home she knew I'm Papa, on TV she used to think, and she used to see me and take that name, ironically. <laughs> <laughs> and then there is a star in the sky, which I talk about in the chapters earlier, which I think is my mother, like every child does, which shines extra bright with happiness when I go out, stand on my terrace. It's like I have lived two live, lifetimes in one. I have crammed 20 years of experiences and happiness in a decade. What am I? Spider-Man? Superman? No. I think I'm blessed. There are times when I feel, I still feel lonely. There are days when I feel very sad at my failures. The sea in front of my bungalow makes me feel just as little as it did 10 years ago. I cannot answer a question which is asked to me in every interview. What is the real Shah Rukh Khan like? I don't know. Maybe there is no real left, real me left anymore. Maybe there is no real emotion left, which I haven't done in front of the camera already. Maybe I'm just an act now. Sometimes I don't recognize my face without the makeup on. Sometimes I don't come alive till I hear the, beginning, the sound of the Ariflex. Ariflex is the camera. Oh, this is ThinkFest, everyone would know that. <laughs> Some days even the sound of the camera and the lights in my eyes don't help me to feel real. The boundaries between the real me and the real me have faded beyond repair. Do I love like Rahul or does Rahul love like me? Is it Raj's anger or am I angry playing Raj over and over again? I know I would never throw a girl off a terrace, but I'm not sure if like Devdas, I would destroy myself for a girl. Maybe, maybe not. Would my son grow up to be normal? Would my daughter realize I'm not Amir Khan? I don't know and I don't care really. Have I paid a big price for being a star? No. If I was given a choice, I would do it all over again and would be willing to give even more. Would I die happy only if my last film was a hit? <laughs> As for now, I'm looking forward to the next 20 years. Just when you thought it was safe to assume I will retire now that I've written a book, I'm going to subject you to another decade. The green cloth is fluttering behind my back the 40-odd feet don't seem too much. I know why I do this. I do it because I'm an actor. I spread out my hands, close my eyes. I can hear the storm fans loud and clear. I see my son's face. He thinks I'm a hero. He knows I have wings. I know too, God is kind and with me. I also know I can fly. I let go, I'm flying, and so is the rest of the world with me. To be continued after a decade later. I, I, I know I have a publisher who's going to kill me for doing this, but no. Shah Rukh, I believe the bell has rung before I even began to start talking to you. Okay. <laughs> um, so are you going to root with me and tell me to get out of here now? <laughs> Why, no chamak chal ho? No chamak chal ho. <laughs> um, just one or two more questions, if you all will allow me. We are, uh, um, we, we are running short of time, but Shah Rukh, one sees these fragments of you, you know, the <clears throat> public self of you is somebody completely different. Flamboyant, you know, as you said, somebody who loves wading into crowds. But there's an element in you that's always alone. You know, you're always, uh, as I said, at three o'clock, four o'clock at night, your tweets are always about this separation of self uh, from the public. Why has that persisted over the years? You know, has, has nothing filled up the vacuum in you? Uh, <clears throat> honestly, no, and uh, I, I don't know, I, there is something wrong with me and um, I, I, I sense it, I feel it, but I don't know what it is. I, I love to act, or so I believe, as far as now is concerned. Um, I always want to keep working to fill in the time. I have a beautiful family, they're very loving to me and uh, I'm, I, I get really, uh, um, the only happiness I get is when I'm with them. I've got a few friends who love me a lot. I spend a lot of time with them. But I find myself, um, sometimes my personal life and my public life. And I try to give. I'm an actor. I'm supposed to give. And whatever people say about me in terms of he's like this, he's like this, he's like that, I know sometimes and I know it honestly. There is no other reason for me to be doing this than to fulfill a desire to give. 
I don't wake up anymore in the mornings thinking how many crores my film has made. I don't want to know which star has done well, but I can't explain it because sometimes with all their good intentions or silly ones, people only ask me this, how do you feel this star has done this? How you? And I get angsty and angry, but I control myself lest I'm put in jail again or fight again. So I control myself and I put up a brave front and I keep on acting and I make it flamboyant and I make it humorous and I make it fun. It's very nice to be, and I'm saying it honestly, I somehow feel that people here will at least, if not completely feel it, understand what I'm talking about. And, you know, every day, um, the reason to go and act is not like I said, the crores or number one, number two, or number 203, or 40, 45, and uh, 100 crore, and 200, nah, I don't want it anymore. I've got everything, much more than a boy sitting on the roundabout in Kamari Auditorium watching cars go by because his father can't afford to buy a film ticket. Can have. You can't take that away from me. You, can't, you can take away the awards, the money. You can't take away the fact that I became Shah Rukh Khan. I became somebody else, really. And uh, <clears throat> so, I, so, so, so why do I do it? And this is deeply emotional for me. So why do I do it? And I've only said this here. <clears throat> I only do it because I know somewhere, in some strange place, a lonely mother with a strange child is just having a great laugh watching one film of mine somewhere. And <clears throat> when I think of the reason that I do what I do this for, whether it is because I lost my parents early, I can't keep on harping about it. Everybody loses parents and it's all right. Get over it. Do I do this because, you know, yeah, I, I worked hard, I became a star and X, Y, Z, and now the money is important, the awards, I've done enough of that. But somewhere there is this feeling of emptiness, which I started to share in Twitter, but that also became uh, sound bites for television and tabloids. They take it out of context and put it, and I can't explain to them. So I have this restlessness, this uh, loneliness, this strangeness, this unfulfilledness, uh, which I feel I'm going to fill it in with as much acting, as much I can give. Uh, but it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And um, so I, I now have dedicated my life to come out in public and give you what you want. Uh, if you want me to dance, I'll dance for you. If you want me to sing, I'll sing for you. If you want me to um, stand on my hands, I'll still do that. If somebody says he's not a serious enough actor, I'll accept it. If somebody says, you know what, he's too flamboyant, he's not the guy who's going to do socially relevant films, it's all right. I've done one with this, I'm not going to do ten of them. I'll do what I feel like, but I will do most of the time things that I think you want me to do. There is nothing left in my life, I feel, that I want to do for myself. So it's a very strange, selfless, selfish place. I have, as I said in the beginning, I think turned into a commercial poet. So I have the thoughts of a poet. I want to do good things, I want to do creative things, I want to gentle, but I don't want to... Uh, <clears throat> I don't want to die like my father did. And I don't want to be unknown uh, despite being the most wonderful father, despite being the... <clears throat> I don't know, I, as much as I love calling my dad, a successful failure. I'd like to be just bloody successful. That's all, honestly. And, and they're right when they say, I didn't believe it. But believe you me, it is very lonely at the top. So you have to, you have to, have to be lonely when you try to be successful. Shahrukh, you said you'll dance for us, but because this is Think and you've made it so special, I'm going to allow you to read what you brought, finally. Do we have time? We'll, we'll, we'll stop with just one thing of that you want to read. Okay, so whenever you want to stop, just stop it, okay? I'll stop it. Just say, cut! Cut! All right, okay. So, I, I really, genuinely, I, I, this is really nice. Thank you so much. Um, I've had, uh, I don't, it's so strange that some of the personal things I would like to discuss with my best friends, not that Shoma is not my best friend, but it's nice to share it with everyone. I don't know. I've. Uh, uh, these are very, yeah, so thank you, thank you. I, I was, I've been very depressed for the last two days. I have no reason for it. I just romanticize as the dark space that creative people go into. But uh, thank you very much for listening to all this. It's making me feel very happy, so I'm gonna drink a lot at the Think Fest and have a great evening with you guys. But I, I'm, 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 thank you for allowing me to read this. 
Um, <clears throat> this is a little part of a poem that I read. I prepared this in the plane for you, Shoma, and for Thahelka and everyone here. Uh, and it's not, in, it's not in any sequence. We just thoughts that were coming because I was sent your email that it's about the solitude of being a movie star or a superstar. So, <clears throat> so it's a part of a poem from W.H. Auden. That's how you pronounce it? So I wish you first a sense of theater. Only those who love illusion and know it will go far. Otherwise, we spend our lives in a confusion of what we say and do with who we really are. This is an uh, audience poem to a seven-year-old, I think, grandson or the son. Adulation has the distinct quality of isolation. You cannot admire that which you cannot distinguish as extraordinary. To be adored in the manner of stardom is to be brutally separated from the right to be ordinary. Paradoxically, this severance results in making nothing more stark to a man than his own ordinariness. I'm aware of it. He may layer it, hide it, or pretend it away, but he feels it in the most naked of ways. Stardom presents a unique opportunity to accept or reject ordinary because the isolation it imposes has two aspects. One is to enable detached clarity, the other to cloud reality entirely. It is easy when faced with the truth about one's ordinariness to turn away from it. The way of the mist is to diffuse form. It is easy to unravel also. Hard to hold the imperfection of yourself and sift unbridled adulation into a genuine love for your craft and person. It is hard, but it is possible. It is possible when you begin to create for the sheer joy of creation or creating because somehow you're not in the business of destruction. Acting is an art form. It is often mistaken as the ability to pretend, but in fact it is the ability to mirror different selves onto the canvas of your own being. It is the art of becoming a new self with complete honesty. An actor true to his craft cannot reject his imperfections. He embraces them and turns them into creative force. Isolation enables the detached observation of himself and his world through which an actor can enhance this creative force. Detachment of a certain kind allows complex emotions to be worn like costumes. In my case, because I do commercial films, the costumes are very simple. Ralph Lauren, anger. Dolce and Gabbana, love. Pacioti, romance. Just about describes my complete emotional wardrobe. As the world changes, this interpretation is rendered more and more through various media. I become a cad, a philanderer, a womanizer, an abusive drunk, a callous, arrogant star who flouts rules and smokes indiscriminately in public, an anti-national, enemy-supporting upstart who ought to be taught a lesson, and so on, or a perfect family man, an astute businessman, a doting father, sex on toast, or even just a guy who smells beautiful. None of this has to do with who I really am, yet it becomes the way I'm perceived by many. Here is where my public journey deviates from my personal experience and sometimes pushes me into a more isolated space than I wish to be in. Detached or attached, the one thing I cannot avoid is what my persona is interpreted as seen from the outside. As honest and similar as I believe my public and personal appearances and beliefs are, I do get overtaken by what people want to perceive of me because of being completely objectified over the last 20 years. My emotions and actions are all objects open for sale and analysis. I'm a billion dollar soul selling machine who romanticizes sleeping on Mumbai sidewalks before becoming such a beautiful object. But I do not gain satisfaction from the money I earn, from how many crores my movies collect, as I said, and for whether I'm rated as number one, two, or 203. I never wake up in the morning wondering about who has become more popular than me. It is of no concern to me. I gain satisfaction from the aspect of my art that allows me to give. I feel satisfied at the thought that somewhere in a home I do not know, a mother and her little son watch my movie on an otherwise dull day and laugh at me. I gain satisfaction at the fact that people leave the cinema with lightness in their heart, feeling love, feeling the possibilities of romance in their everyday ordinariness of their daily lives. However unreal it seems to critics or lovers of reality, I serve reality with chocolate-flavored popcorn, available only in large size and fizzy soda to go with it. And yet, this last bit, I heard the bell. And yet, I live reality in its crudest form, where every human defect and perfection is magnified, 
where every desire, every aspiration is stark like mine, where every power drives an enormous system towards its own growth and churning and even destru destruction, but it tastes bloody good. And through all this, I'm surrounded by a hundred managers and PRs and producers and financers and audiences. And the only way I keep it sane is by clinging to the only person I know the best, myself, all alone. But to be alone amidst millions of admirers is no tragedy at all. It is beautiful, especially if we can use it to view the world as I began the speech with, a sense of theater. So welcome to my theater, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, the dream catcher. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I'm sorry for the next speaker having to wait. Thank you very much, everyone. God bless you. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. One day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, we share.